Um, Srinath came up to me after the last lecture and, and pointed out that one of my slides, uh, maybe more than one, but at least one was a bit confusing. Uh, and I don't want to get into the details right now, but the point is that um, if anything here that I mention is confusing and you'd like to better understand it, you know, feel free to reach out to me, you know, one-on-one -on -one or in small group sessions. I'd be happy to try to clarify some of the confusing issues. Um, and Aman also came up to me and asked me a question. Now, his question, in a way, is a little easier to answer. So uh, when I was talking about the eight slices versus the 24 versus, I think it was 46 and 92, uh, just to be clear, I was talking about number of slices in a 3D acquisition, not number of frequency encodes. Um, so if that clears anything up for you, that's great. If what I'm saying now also sounds like mumbo jumbo, uh, then you know, come up to me you know, afterwards and I'll try to explain it. So I'd like to thank uh, Srinath and Amon for coming up to me and asking questions. I guess I should also make it clear that um, this doesn't have to be as didactic as it's been. So if you have questions, you know, raise your hand and, or shout out. Uh, I will then repeat your question for posterity since we're being recorded. But if you have any questions, you know, feel free to just, you know, interrupt, okay? Uh, I will not be offended by interruptions. Uh, my feelings are hurt by iPhones, but my feelings are not hurt by interruptions. So please do interrupt. Okay, so now we're going to talk about diffusion-weighted imaging, which is something that UCSD, due to Anders Dale, Nate White, um, and David Caro, uh, we've really become... Uh, sort of world experts now. In, now. I am not myself a world expert, but I will now talk about diffusion-weighted uh, imaging because we as a department uh, are really leading uh, the charge in this, in this field. This is a complicated topic, and so let me start with the take-home messages and then I'll end at the end with the take-home messages. So in the year 2017, diffusion-weighted imaging is mainly a qualitative tool mainly for lesion detection. It's a conspicuity sequence. It's sometimes useful for lesion characterization, and I'll just touch on that, but it's really used for lesion detection. Um, and by what I mean by lesion detection, I think it's self-evident. What do I mean by lesion characterization? Diffusion doesn't usually tell you whether something's benign or malignant. It doesn't usually tell you whether it's inflammatory or neoplastic. Sometimes it does. So, but mainly it's, it's detection. You see things. Now, diffusion is not robust. There are many, many pitfalls. You cannot tell normal from malignant lymph nodes using diffusion, for example. Bowel is often bright on diffusion, so it's very hard to tell the difference between normal bowel and malignant bowel with diffusion. It's possible, but it's not that easy. There's many blind spots, so the left lobe of the liver and the liver dome. So the second most important organ in the human body um, has blind spots with uh, diffusion. Uh, now this is going to be a little bit hyperbolic, but much of the terminology that radiologists have used over the years for diffusion-weighted imaging is incorrect. And me personally, I have to thank uh, Nate White, Anders Dale, and David Caro for teaching me the correct terms, which are free, fast, impeded, hindered, and restricted, and we'll talk more about those terms later. All clinical diffusion-weighted imaging is T2-weighted imaging, is T2-weighted in addition to diffusion-weighted. So DWI is actually a misnomer. I mean, it's, it would be too much of a mouthful to do this, but whenever you think DWI, you should think it's T2 and diffusion-weighted imaging. It's not just diffusion-weighted. It's always, always, always T2-weighted, at least as applied in 2017 for clinical care. Diffusion-weighted imaging will make some things look brighter, but they only look brighter. Everything gets darker on diffusion-weighted imaging. So when you say that something brightens up, it doesn't really brighten up, it just gets less darker, okay? So everything gets darker when you do diffusion-weighted imaging. Just some things get more dark and some things get less dark. Technical tip. We already talked a little bit about the last lecture, we'll talk about it again. Always, 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 if you can, use parallel imaging. Use a low matrix, use strong gradients, minimize your TE. Quantitative DWI is still not ready for prime time, at least not in the abdomen, at least not 99% of the time. Now, I'm not saying that 
no one should do quantitative DWI. If you really know what you're doing, you know, like you're David Carroll, you're an Anders Dale, you're Nate White, uh, then sure, you can do quantitative DWI. But what I mean is not ready for prime time is that it's not ready for the masses of radiologists out there to do quantitative DWI. It's not ready for prime time. Okay, so the outline, we're going to talk about the following things. We're going to talk about diffusion and diffusivity. We're going to talk about diffusion regimes. We're going to talk about diffusion weighted imaging. We're going to talk about this funny thing called the B value. We're going to talk about this thing called the apparent diffusion coefficient. We're going to just touch upon more advanced diffusion parameters, such as those that are being developed by uh, Anders. We're going to talk about some applications of DWI, some technical tips and pitfalls. Then I'll just introduce restriction spectrum imaging, or RSI, and conclude with some take-home uh, messages. So let's start with what is diffusion, and this goes back now to high school physics. So diffusion is simply the random motion of molecules, and in the human body, uh, we are really looking at water molecules, because fat molecules don't really diffuse very much. So we're really looking at water molecules. So let's now look at a thought experiment. Let's start with seven water molecules, which I've named one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And we will allow these water molecules to move. And notice that they move randomly, so that after a couple seconds, the water molecules now have this configuration. But the motion is random, meaning that if I could go back in time and redo it, then just by random chance, the motions would be different, and the water molecules would end up in different locations. So these water molecules are moving randomly, and I cannot predict, nor can anyone, not even Tanya Wilson can predict, is she still here? No, she's still here. Even, not even Tanya Wilson can predict where they're going to be, although she might be able to put some kind of probability cloud uh, around it. So that's diffusion, random, random motion. What is diffusivity? So diffusivity, or D, is a physical parameter, this is a mouthful, that indicates the average distance, the average random displacement of those molecules as a function of time. So in other words, if the molecules are moving all over the place, and you could literally measure, and this would be a fun thing I think to do, measure one million molecules and see how far each one of these one million molecules moved and took the average, that would be the diffusivity. And SUDA, that could be your next study, okay? We'll take one million molecules and, and measure them. And this diffusivity is a property of the substance or the medium. So it's a, it's a property of the tissue itself. That's diffusivity. So let's now look at this random motion uh, and these average distances. So let's take this water molecule and have it make its random path. And its random path looks like that. And after a certain time t, it has moved this distance r. But it's random, right? So if we took another water molecule and had it do its random path, it might do this. And after time t, it's moved this far. And this molecule has moved this far. And this molecule has moved this far. And don't worry, I will not do this a million times. Uh, I will do it four times. But let's pretend I did it a million times, or let's pretend I did it an infinite amount of times. After an infinite amount of times, uh, oops, there it is, an infinite number of times, these water molecules on average would move an average distance. I don't know if you can see it, but there's intended to be sort of like a cloud over there. And that cloud has a radius called root mean square radius. So the radius root mean squared is sort of the average distance that a million or an infinite number of water molecules would move, the average distance they would move after a certain amount of time. So now we turn to Albert Einstein in 1905, who I think he was 25 years old, and he wrote four papers that year, each one of which could have won him the Nobel Prize. Um, and one of them did win him the Nobel Prize, but it wasn't this one. Does anyone know which of his four papers in, uh, in, did I say 2005? In 1905. Uh, in 1905, does anyone know which one of his four papers won the Nobel Prize? So your choices are this one, uh, Investigations on the Theory of the Brownian Movement, in which he 
comes up with the formula for diffusivity so that Suda does not actually have to measure the motion a million times. So that's choice A. Choice B is the theory of special relativity. Choice three is the photoelectric effect. And choice four, I can't remember. So we know it's not choice four. Um, we know it's cho not choice one, because I already told you it's not this one. So is it the photoelectric effect or is it the theory of special relativity? And the answer, oh, Jonathan Hooker knows the answer. Yes, it's the photoelectric effect. Good. So, but, and by the way, what was Albert Einstein doing as a profession in 1905? I hear a lot of mumbling. Yes, he was a patent clerk. Where did he live? Switzerland. Switzerland, yes. I think it was Geneva, actually. Okay, anyway, so, but don't worry, we're not, I love Albert Einstein. He's my father's hero, actually. Um, at any rate, the formula that Albert Einstein came up with when he was a patent clerk, and so this is what he did in his spare time, is he figured out that the root mean squared is a property of the tissue, and it's the square root of 2 times d times t, where d is the diffusivity. And now even I can do this math, so I can take this formula here and figure out if this is the formula, then the diffusivity must be the root mean squared divided by 2t. Now, I don't necessarily want you to necessarily have to memorize this other than the following, that the diffusivity is the surface area. So again, I don't know how well you can see this cloud, but there's sort of a spherical cloud here that has a surface area. And the diffusivity is the surface area as a function of time. So you can think of the diffusivity as, for a certain amount of time, how big is the sphere that, 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 that describes the average motion of these water molecules? And what's the surface area of that sphere? And the surface area of that sphere per unit time is the diffusivity. And the reason that this is helpful to know is that the diffusivity, that sounds a little bit like ADC, so if you've ever wondered why ADC has units of millimeter squared per second, now you know it's Albert Einstein's fault. So the ADC has units of millimeter squared per second because that's what Albert said in 1905. How old was he, by the way, in 1905? So he was 25 years old. So I don't know if any of you are under 25, but if any, I think we're probably all over 25. So uh, anyway, okay. Well, what are random displacements then? So what's the diffusivity of different things at 37 degrees Celsius? So pure water is 3 uh, micrometers squared per millisecond. And nuclear water, well, anyway, here are some values for pure water, extracellular water, cytoplasmic water, and nuclear water. But these, these, these numbers, you know, what, what do they mean? It's hard to understand them. Well, remember that uh, the diffusivity is a function of time. In MRI, we're typically using diffusion times of about 50 milliseconds. So these are the distances we're talking about. So when we talk about diffusion-weighted imaging, we're talking about motions of pure water of about 17 microns, extracellular water of 10 microns, cytoplasmic water of 7 microns, and nuclear water of 11 microns. So basically, as an order of magnitude, we're looking at motions of about 10 microns. Now, diffusion regimes, what do I mean by that? Again, two beakers of water, seven water molecules. Here's pure water, and that's purely random motion, that's free motion. Now let's look at the beaker on the right, and let's add some physical barriers and see what ha those physical barriers do to these water molecules. Now these water molecules are sort of vibrating around, right? They're not moving as much. They're not quite so random. And after a certain amount of time, notice that these are in a completely random location. These joggled around randomly within their spatial constraints, but notice that they're still sort of in the same general uh, relation as they were at the beginning. So this is free diffusion, and this diffusion is not free. It's impeded. So on the one situation, we have unimpeded or free diffusion. In the other situation, we have impeded diffusion. So impeded diffusion is diffusion that occurs in the presence of some sort of physical uh, barrier. Now, impeded diffusion can be hindered or it can be restricted. And to understand that, let's again put two beakers of water, but now let's have some cells. So we have cells here, 
and we have cells here. And now let's look at water molecules that are in the extracellular space and water molecules that are in the cells. And now what I want you to do is pretend that the cell membranes are impermeable and do a thought experiment. What does the diffusion of these water molecules look like? And what does the diffusion of these water molecules look like? Well, if we do the experiment, sorry, go back in time here. Well, these water molecules can be jiggling around, right? But they're going to stay confined within their cells. What about the stuff in the extracellular matrix? That stuff can slither around, right? So water molecules that are in the extracellular space can slither around. Water molecules that are inside cells are stuck within cells. So you see, they're not all the same, are they? And the difference is that water that is impaired but can slither around, that's considered hindered. So the extracellular water is hindered, whereas the intracellular water is restricted. It can't get out of the cells. Now here's a graph that I made that is adapted from a graph that Nate White made, so I have to thank him for the concept. But the idea is that we have free water, we have hindered water in between the cells, and we have restricted water within the cells. And notice that if I allow more and more time to occur, the water that's completely free will diffuse an infinite distance if I allow it enough time. Notice also that the water that's outside the cells will also eventually diffuse an infinite distance, but not quite as rapidly as the free. So both will diffuse an infinite distance, but this will go faster than this. What about the stuff inside the cells? If I give this an infinite amount of time, eventually it doesn't change, right? It, it fills the cells and then you will observe no more diffusion. So if you were to plot the displacements as a function of the square root of time, you would see that for free diffusion, as the time goes up, the diffusion increases. For hindered, you would also see that with infinite time, you'd have infinite displacement, but at a slightly lower rate, hence the slope is a little bit lower. What would this look like? Well, if you wait an infinite amount of time, it won't keep on displacing. So the restricted water looks different. And the reason this is relevant to us clinically is, ooh, this is now, ah, okay. So that's the displacement. So this is now the effective diffusivity, which is back to Einstein. This is a, a function of how much things will expand as a function of time. So, the, so free water will, if you give it more and more time, will diffuse further and further and further. Hence, it's constant. Because no matter how much time you give it, the diffusivity is unaffected. It's always being, it's always sort of diffusing at the same rate. Same thing with hindered water. It, it, it's always diffusing at the same rate, slower than the pure water, but it's always diffusing at a constant rate. What about this? Well, this is diffusing initially, but then it stops diffusing, right? So this looks very different. This is diffusing initially, but then it stops diffusing and eventually appears not to diffuse at all. And the reason this is important is that on clinical MRI, we have diffusion times that look like this. And what does this mean? What this means is that free water in blue and hindered water in green have similar diffusion properties. They're not quite the same. The hindered water is a little bit slower than the blue water, than the free water, but they're fairly similar. But it's the restricted water that looks very, very different. So the take-home message is that on clinical MRI in year 2017, restricted water, the stuff inside the cells, looks very, very different than the stuff that's outside the cells. And the stuff that's outside the cells looks only a little bit different than the stuff that's um, completely free. But it's a little bit more complicated than this because we also have to deal with perfusion. So in addition to these cells, we also have capillaries running through them. And if you think about it, the water molecules running through these capillaries are going to go through these capillaries very, very fast. And so even faster than free water is the motion through these capillaries. So capillaries will have even faster diffusion than free water. Now it's not truly diffusion, it's actually perfusion, 
but the MRI scanner can't tell the difference. Or, to plot it the other way, this is the plot I showed you before with the free water, the hindered water, and the restricted water. Now let's add the perfusing water, and it looks like this. So what's the take-home message? The take-home message is that perfusing water looks different than free water. Free water looks a little bit different, but fairly similar to hindered water. And all of these look very different than restricted water. One of the things that Nate White and Anders Dale are trying to do is they're trying to see if they can uh, explore this space out here by changing the diffusion time. So that's a discussion for another day. Okay, so now we've talked a lot about physics. Now let's start switching to radiology. So what is diffusion-weighted imaging? Diffusion weighting imaging is imaging that generates contrast based on differences in diffusion. So, in other words, things with one kind of diffusion will look bright, things with another kind of diffusion will look dark. That's it. Diffusion weighted imaging is imaging that tries to create differences in contrast based on diffusion. It's a misnomer. It's a misnomer because all diffusion weighted imaging is T2 weighted. All diffusion weighted imaging has TEs of at least 50 milliseconds. So it's always T2 weighted. So we really should call it T2 weighted and diffusion weighted imaging. Now we don't because that's really clunky. Who wants to say all that? But mentally, every time you do DWI in your own mind, think this imaging is T2 weighted and diffusion weighted. So I'm calling it DWI, but in my own mind, it's T2 and DWI. Now in the liver, it works out really well because, in, well, with the exception of those technical challenges, but except for the technical challenges, it works out very well. Is it turns out that most tumors in the liver have both impeded diffusion and they have long T2. And because diffusion-weighted imaging is diffusion-weighted, and because diffusion-weighted imaging is also T2-weighted, both the impeded diffusion and the long T2 make tumors look bright. So in diffusion-weighted imaging, tumors in the liver look bright because they have impeded diffusion or long T2 or both. They act synergistically. And that's why, at its best, diffusion-weighted imaging in the liver is so powerful because liver tumors usually, not always, usually have impeded diffusion and T2. They act synergistically. Tumors in the liver look very bright. Okay, how do we do diffusion-weighted imaging? So, rhetorical question. We start with a 90-degree radio frequency pulse. We do a 180-degree refocusing pulse and we collect an echo. What is that called when you do a 90, a 180, and you get an echo? I'll give you a hint. This echo is called a spin echo. So what is a sequence called? This is a spin echo sequence. So this is one of the first things you learn when you're studying MRI is the diagram for a spin echo sequence. So diffusion weighted imaging starts with a spin echo sequence. So right away we can sort of feel comfortable. Not so complicated, right? We're just doing a spin echo sequence. And when you do a spin echo sequence, we know that the echo time is the time between the excitation pulse, halfway through the excitation pulse, and halfway through the echo. So it's the peak of the excitation pulse and the peak of the echo, of the spin echo, that's your TE. Not so complicated, right? So far, so good. This is pretty easy. I get it. I get it. Uh, now we're going to add some diffusion gradients. It gets a little bit more complicated, but not so bad, right? We're going to add a gradient here. We're going to add a gradient here. So one before the 180, one after the 180. Notice that both gradients are pointing in the same direction. But there's a 180 in between them. So because this gradient is pointing up, and this gradient is pointing up, but it's after the refocusing pulse, this gradient effectively has the opposite polarity of this gradient. So this gradient is going to reverse whatever this gradient did. So you can think of this gradient as a dephasing gradient. And you can think of this gradient as a rephasing gradient. Because even though it's pointing the same direction, it's on the other side of the 180. And then we have these fancy Greek letters. Um, and, you know, a little intimidating, but that's okay. So here we have like a little delta, and this just means that this gradient has a certain duration, so like 10 milliseconds, um, and this gradient has the same duration. Big G is simply the gradient amplitude, so that's how high this gradient is. 
And this big delta, or capital delta, is just the diffusion time. So on MRI, on diffusion, there's a gradient strength, there's a gradient duration, and there's a gradient separation. Not so complicated. I can follow this. Um, now let's look at these gradient. Now let's look at this gradient. So this gradient is going to be very weak on one side, right? It's going to, well, I shouldn't say the gradient's weak. The gradient is going to cause the magnetic field to be uh, low at one end and higher at the other end. And let's see what it does to impeded water, water that doesn't move around very much. So here's a water molecule, and here's a water molecule, and initially these water molecules are in phase. But then this gradient comes on, and what is this gradient going to do to these water molecules? Well, the gradient is going to cause this water molecule to spin faster than this water molecule, right? Because the gradient, the magnetic field is higher here than here, so this proton experiences a greater magnetic field than this one. The precessional frequency is proportional to the magnetic field, so this will precess faster than this. So what will that look like? Looks like this, right? So this one is now pointing down, and this one is pointing off to the side, and these are no longer quite in phase. And then we apply a 180. So what does the 180 do? Well, the 180 simply flips them. So this flips from here to here. And this one was already pointing down, so it just sort of stays down. So far, so good. Now we have this gradient. What is this gradient going to do? Well, the gradient is pointing in the same direction. So it's going to cause this to spin this way. It's going to cause this to spin this way. Which one's going to spin faster? This one or this one? Rhetorical question. Which one spins faster, the one that's experiencing the greater magnetic field or the one that's experiencing the weaker magnetic field? The one, of course, experiencing the greater magnetic field. And so what is that going to look like? It's going to look like this. So notice that after, now, sorry my cartoons are a little bit off. I have to sort of fix the pivot points here. I apologize for that. But the point is that when you have impeded water, this gradient causes dephasing. This gradient causes rephasing, and guess what? You have a big spin echo, a lot of signal. What happens when you have diffusing or perfusing water? Well, here we start with our water molecules again. We apply the gradients, and again, we do our dephasing. But now, these water molecules are moving around, right? So now, when we do the 180, Okay, we flipped it, just, you know, so this gets flipped. But now we apply this gradient. Is this gradient going to be able to refocus these water molecules? These water molecules are no longer where they were here, right? They're no longer where they were here. So when we apply this gradient, what's going to happen? Well, this one will precess faster. This one will precess slower. So are these water molecules in phase? No. How much signal are we going to get from this? Not much. So with impeded water, we get a lot of signal. With diffusing or perfusing water, we get little signal. Um, if you couldn't follow all of these cartoons, at least, you know, for now, commit to memory the following. That all other things being equal, impeded water, either hindered or restricted, will look bright. And diffusing or perfusing water, all other things being equal, will look dark. <coughs> And when we actually do diffusion-weighted imaging, we typically acquire this spin echo where the gradients, say, are off or very low, and we get a B0 image. And then we repeat the image with the gradients on, and then we get a diffusion-weighted image, say, with a B equals 500. And so here's our B0 image, and here's our 500 image. So let me pause here for a second. Notice that the echo time, the TE, was the same for the B0 image as for the B500 image, right? The spin, the echo is right here. The TE is the same. The only difference between this image and this image is that this image was applied when I turned the gradients on, and this image was acquired when I either had the gradients off or I had them on at much lower amplitude. But they both have the same echo time. Now, why is that important? That's important because they typically have echo times of about 50 to 100 milliseconds. So both images are T2-weighted. In fact, if you look at this image, doesn't this look like a T2-weighted image? It looks like a T2-weighted image. This image is also T2-weighted, but it's also diffusion-weighted image. Image, I'm sorry, weighted. 
Let's look at these images again. So this is the B0, which is basically a T2 weighted image. This is the B500. This is T2 weighted plus diffusion weighted. So what's the difference between this image and this image? Well, on a T2 weighted image, ascites is bright, CSF is bright, fluid in the stomach is bright, flow, uh, uh, blood vessels with slow flow look bright, blood vessels with high flow look black, so this might be the hepatic artery here, and this might be like uh, a portal vein or something. So some vessels look bright. Bile ducts, those look bright. This is B0, uh, just like a T2-weighted image. Now let's apply the diffusion gradient. And what happens with diffusion gradient is perfusing tissues get dark, so blood in the portal veins, which was bright, gets dark. Uh, bile ducts get dark because that has fast flow. CSF gets dark, so we now the CSF is dark and all we see is the cord. Notice that the cord was here, we just couldn't see the cord before because it was surrounded by bright fluid. Now that the bright fluid is no longer bright, we see the spinal cord. Notice also that uh, the kidneys and the adrenal glands tend to have restricted diffusion, so they look bright. Lymph nodes have restricted diffusion, so they look bright. Uh, why does the aorta look so black? Because it has rapid flow. Why does the fluid in the stomach look darker here than here? Because it has very liquidy flow. And notice now why this sequence can be helpful. That's a metastasis, and that's a metastasis. Now, I don't know that just from these images, but that's a met and that's a met. Can anyone see these mets on these images over here? Well, yeah, in retrospect, there's one of the metastases right there. But notice that you don't notice this metastasis because this is all this other bright biological noise that obscures this metastasis. So one of the reasons why diffusion-weighted imaging is so powerful is it makes all this crap, sorry, I included bile ducts in the crap, I apologize to Suda. It, it makes all these things that we don't want to see get dark, and it allows us to see the things we do want to see, in this case, the metastases. So are these lymph nodes benign or malignant? And the answer is, we don't know. Based on their size, we suspect they're benign, but we don't know. So the point is, diffusion-weighted imaging is very good at detecting lymph nodes, but it cannot tell us by their signal intensity whether they're benign or malignant. Benign nodes will look bright. Malignant nodes will look bright. We cannot tell benign from malignant on diffusion-weighted imaging. Okay, what is the B value? Well, last lecture I showed you probably more T2 relaxation curves than you'll ever want to see again. And so now you're probably cursing under your breath because now I'm showing you more uh, T2 relaxation curves. But these are not T2 relaxation curves. They just look like T2 relaxation curves. Because notice that on the x-axis, I'm no longer showing the echo time. Now I'm showing the B value. So what is the B value? Well, the B value is analogous to the echo time for T2-weighted imaging. So on T2-weighted imaging, we have T2 curves, and on the x-axis, we draw the TE. On diffusion-weighted imaging, in the x-axis, we show the B value. So the B value is the diffusion sensitivity parameter. It's a measure, it's a single number that tells you how diffusion-weighted your images are. So if you have a B value of 10, you're weakly diffusion-weighted. If you have a B value of 1,000, you're heavily diffusion-weighted. A B value has units of seconds over millimeter squared. How horrible is that? It's horrible, right? So why did it come from that? Because the B value is the inverse of the diffusivity, and due to Albert Einstein, diffusivity has units of millimeter squared over seconds, so B value has units of seconds over millimeter squared. At any rate, if we start with 100% signal, and we have very restricted tissue that doesn't lose signal very much, then as the B value goes up, we retain signal. If we have hindered water, we lose signal more rapidly. If we have free water, we lose signal even more rapidly. And if we have perfusing fluid, we lose signal even more rapidly. So as the B value goes up, everything, notice that everything loses signal, just some things lose less signal uh, than others. So all tissues lose signal. And on clinical MRI, we're typically getting B values in this range. 
in the range of about B500 to B1000. In this range, what's bright? Restricted water is bright. Hindered water is very dark gray. And everything else is black. Now, if we were instead to get B values over here, then what would be dark? Perfusing stuff would be dark, and everything else would be bright. What is the B value? Well, here's the formula, which you must commit to memory. Okay, so it's the no, I'm only kidding. But let's look at this again. So here's our pulse diagram, and the B value is proportional to the gyromagnetic ratio. So that's constant, right? We're dealing with hydrogen. That's always going to be 42.6 squared. So we can eliminate that. The B value, notice, is proportional to what? Well, it's proportional to the gradient amplitude squared. It's proportional to the gradient duration uh, squared, with a little arithmetic correction over here. And it's proportional to the diffusion time. So if you want your B value to be higher, how do you make your B value higher? <coughs> Rhetorical question. We'll get back to it in a couple slides. What are typical B values? Zero in the liver, typical B values are 0, 50, 500, and 1,000. Zero means you did not apply the gradients at all, and you have a T2 weighted image with bright bile ducts and bright blood vessels. With a B value of 50, you have low diffusion weighted imaging. Again, you have a T2 weighted image. Now your bile ducts are dark and your blood vessels are dark because they have very rapid flow or very rapid perfusion or pseudo flow. But everything else that would be bright in a T2-8 image is bright. And then you have B500 intermediate. Uh, now a lot of things are dark. And then B value 5,000, uh, everything is dark except for things with restricted diffusion. Everything gets darker. So here is B0. You can see the B0 right here. Here's the liver. Here's the spleen, kidneys, CSF, gallbladder, B0. We go to B50. So Look at the, the blood vessels here. See how you see these uh, vessels, bile ducts and vessels? Now let's go from B0 to B50. What got darker? The blood vessels got darker. Uh, other things got darker too, but it's pretty subtle, right? So if you like, look at the spleen, look at the spleen, look at the spleen, look at the kidney, look at the kidney. See, everything got a little darker. Look at the CSF. Everything's getting darker, right? Now let's go to B500. B50, sorry, this is like you're at the ophthalmologist's office. B50, B500, B50, B500. Everything's getting darker, right? Now let's go to B1000. Everything got darker. So as your B values get higher, everything, everything, everything gets darker. Now if you don't believe me, here is a cancer, B50, and here is a cancer, B600. Let's show them side by side. Now, some of you might be thinking the lesion looks like it has higher, looks brighter on the B600 than it does on the B50 because relative to background tissue, it looks uh, brighter. But there's no question this is brighter than this. And to prove it to you, there we have it. So it's an optical illusion on diffusion that things look like they're getting brighter. They're not getting brighter. Everything, everything gets darker, just some things get darker slower than others. Now, the B value helps us with lesion conspicuity. Does anyone see a metastasis in this liver? If you do, then either you are fabricating or you are an all-star. I certainly don't. That's B0. Does anyone see a tumor here? B50, what's the difference? Notice that the blood vessels got dark or, or started to get dark. I still don't see the tumor. Now... Do we see a tumor of the liver, B500? So now I think you can appreciate it's subtle, but there's, you start to see that there might be something here. And so as your B value gets higher, you start to see tumors. Does anyone see a tumor? New case. Anyone see a tumor here? I don't. Anyone see a tumor now? Anyone see a tumor? So maybe you saw them, but did you see both? This one here by the gallbladder, this one here. So notice that as the B value goes up, our ability to see cancers in the liver go up. So the B value is very important. So how do we increase the B value? 
so we did that mental thought experiment just a little while ago, and let's see it now play out. So we can't change the gyromagnetic ratio, right? The gyromagnetic ratio is a property of the proton. No matter how much you try, you cannot change the gyromagnetic ratio. But can you change the gradient amplitude, the gradient duration, or the gradient separation? So let's increase the gradient. So we can increase the gradient, and that increases the B value. Now, um, why not keep on increasing the gradient? Because you can only increase the gradient until you get to the maximum gradient. And then it's just like Star Trek and Scotty, you just don't have any more dilithium crystals. So once you've reached maximum gradient amplitude, you can keep asking to go higher and higher and higher, but you just can't do it. Well, there is one way to do it. Does anyone know how to increase the gradient once you've reached your maximum? It's a read my mind kind of question. You buy a new scanner, $3 million. So maybe you don't want to do that. And plus it takes time, it takes six months. So you've got a patient in the scanner right now. So what are you gonna do? Well, you can increase your separation and uh, you can also um, increase the duration of each lobe, and those will also increase the B value. But notice that when you increase the diffusion time or the duration, now our echo is superimposed on the gradient. So we actually have to move our echo, don't we? And by moving our echo, what happened to our TE? Our TE got longer. So to summarize, to increase the B value, you can increase the gradient until you've maxed out. And then at that point, your only option is to buy a new scanner. You can increase your diffusion time and inc you can increase your lobe duration, but those will increase your TE, which makes your image more T2 weighted and makes your image have lower signal to noise and increases your acquisition time. So there's a penalty to increasing the B value. Uh, and that's why more and more scanners are putting so much emphasis on having gradients that are as powerful as possible so you can do really high quality DWI without having very long echo times. Now there is one clever trick you can do because you have gradients in the X direction, the Y direction, and the Z direction and I don't know why it took people so long to think about it but someone finally came up with the bright idea that if you turn all the gradients on simultaneously then your net gradient is the vector sum of the three individual gradients. And this is what GEE calls three and one. So there is one trick you can do to increase your diffusion weighted B value without increasing the TE. And that's to use the three and one option on a G scanner. So if you have GE scanners, use three and one for abdominal applications. If you don't have a GE scanner, I'm sure Siemens and Philips have the equivalent. I just know what it's called. Okay, what is the ADC? Well, um, I mentioned before that the B value defines the diffusion, the signal loss as a function of diffusion weighting. And just like on T2, we have an exponential decay curve that we can blame Felix Bloch for. Here we have a very similar exponential uh, curve that looks like this. So the ADC is basically the parameter that we plug into this diffusion uh, equation that assumes uh, an exponential decay. So that was a mouthful. What I'm trying to say here is that if we assume that all tissues are composed of one tissue type and they're all losing signal at the same rate, then we can define this by a single exponential, and that exponential is called the apparent diffusion coefficient. Now why do we call it the apparent diffusion coefficient, why don't we call it the diffusion coefficient? Because the ADC is an approximation, it's not actually correct. Because it assumes that everything is decaying at the same rate, which is incorrect. Uh, different tissues are decaying at different rates. So in addition, for reasons I don't want to get into right now, the ADC depends not only on the B value, it also depends. It depends. It also depends on exactly how that sequence diagram was created. So that for so if you're not following all this, here's the 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 the, the key message. We call it the apparent diffusion coefficient 
because it's not a true physical correct parameter. It's approximately correct. Because it's approximately correct, you might then wonder, can I take the ADC values that people publish and apply them to my patients? So you might read a paper in radiology that says an ADC of 1.1 uh, had an accuracy of 92% for differentiating metastases to the liver from hemangiomas. So can you then do diffusion-weighted imaging on your scanner, measure the ADC, and apply that cutoff value? So um, this is a, this is a, you have two, two options for this rhetorical question. The answer is, yes, you can use published ADC values, or the answer is, no, you can't. And the answer is, unlike with Barack Obama, where the answer was, yes, we can, the answer here is, no, we cannot. Do not take published ADC values and apply them to your scanner uh, because the ADC depends not just on the B value, but also on lots of other things that uh, complicate the relationship, including it, the exact manner in which your scanner uh, collected uh, the data. And one of the reasons that the ADC is incorrect, though, is not because of the scanner, it's because of physics. So here is our assumption that things are losing signal as an exponential. But the problem is that um, tissues have different components. So shown in black is if we assume the tissue is a single component. But that tissue is actually composed of the green stuff, which has restricted diffusion, and also of this red stuff, which is perfusing. So the perfusing stuff loses signal faster than the green stuff. And so the real equation looks like this. So it's no longer an exponential. It's now a bi-exponential. Now, if you're not following all this, don't worry about it too much. The, the key thing here is that the assumption of exponential decay is incorrect. So that's one reason why the ADC doesn't work. At least not, it, it, it doesn't work in a quantitative sense. It's fundamentally incorrect. But even this complicated bi-exponential is incorrect because, in fact, if you really want to do it right, you'd want to look at the component that's perfusing, the component that's hindered, the component that's restricted within the nucleus, the part that's restricted within the cytoplasm. You'd also want to look at the direction of flow, multiple different confounders, as well as manufacturer dependencies. So if you really want to do diffusion-weighted imaging quantitatively, uh, this is all the stuff you'd have to take into account. Is there anyone in the world who's taking all of this into account? No. No one is taking this all into account. That's why I'm saying quantitative DWI is not yet ready for prime time because no one is looking at all of the various factors that affect the signal measurements. So why do we do diffusion-weighted imaging? We do it mainly for lesion detection. Okay, second most important organ in the human body. This patient has three HCCs in their liver. Can anyone see the HCCs in this liver on CT? Well, some of you probably saw this tumor here, and some of you might have noticed this one over here. See, it's hyper-enhancing and washing out. So here are two HCCs on CT. But we all know that MRI is infinitely better than CT, right? So let's look at this MRI. So how many HCCs do we see? Now this MRI, by the way, was done one day after the CT. I'm sure this never happens at Navy, but at UCSD, every once in a while, we have a scheduling snafu. And even though we didn't want the patient to have a CT and MRI one day apart, there, there you have it. I'm sure this never happens at Navy. Um, but at UCSD, it sometimes does. So how many HCCs do we see on this MRI one day after the CT? Now, arguably, you see this HCC better here than you do here. Arguably, you see this one better, but you still only see two, right? Anyone see a third? Some people think they do. Anyone see a third? Now you see it. It's right there, the blue arrow. Now do you see it on the arterial face? There it was. And now do you see it on the portal venous and delayed? It's right there. See that? It's actually, wa it's actually washing out. But I didn't see it until I saw the diffusion. How about this case over here? How many HCCs does this patient have? Well, I think most of you probably see one of them for sure, right? It's 
this one here. Anyone see the second HCC? Uh, well, let's do the same trick and put on the diffusion. So that's the one we just saw. Now does anyone see a second one? There it is. Where was it on the arterial phase? Right there. And did we see it in the hepatobiliary phase? Yep, right there, and there it was at 80 seconds. So diffusion can be a very powerful conspicuity sequence. Well, what about T2? What about in and out of phase? What about B0? No, it was the diffusion. Notice you can't see it here. You can't see it here. You can't see it here. It was really the B500 that allowed us to see that additional cancer. Um, this is just to show that it can also show cancers outside the liver. So these are serosal implants along the liver surface and some with appendiceal carcinoma. Once you see this, you see that. Notice that you can't see these at all on CT. The CT was done a couple days before this MRI. Just to brag about Albert Chow. Uh, so Albert has brought, and also about Ryan. So Albert and Ryan are bringing some very advanced uh, MRI to UCSD. So here's the DISCO technique that they brought from Stanford. And this DISCO allows us to image the liver every three or four seconds during the arterial phase. Uh, and there's a cancer here. Anyone see the second cancer? And maybe some of you see it. But certainly when we get to the DWI, it becomes pretty obvious, right? It's right here. Now, what, and then in retrospect, you can see it here and then over there somewhere. What about characterization? Is DWI helpful for characterization? In select cases, yes. If you're, if you're pretty knowledgeable, you can use it. So here we have a cancer and here we have a cancer. Ignore that cancer. Just look at this one and look at this one. This patient has cirrhosis. This patient has cirrhosis. Rhetorical question. Patients with cirrhosis are at high risk for developing what two types of cancer? So one of those cancers, I hope all of you immediately know, patients with cirrhosis are at high risk for developing hepatocellular carcinoma. Are patients with cirrhosis at risk for getting any other kind of cancer? And the answer is yes, they're at risk for getting cholangiocarcinoma. We can talk later about what that is. Do we care whether someone has an HCC or a cholangio? Yes, we do, because HCCs don't tend to metastasize outside of the liver until very, very late. So if you have an HCC, you can get a liver transplant and be cured. If you have a cholangio, you really can't get a liver transplant because the cholangiocarcinoma has already escaped by the time you detect it. So which one is the cholangio and which one is the HCC? Rhetorical question, is this a cholangio? Or is this a cholangio and vice versa? Is this an HCC or is this an HCC? So let's look at the diffusion here. Can I convince you that the diffusion here is fairly homogeneous? There's no difference between the inside and the outside. And can I convince you that this one looks different, right? It's higher diffusion on the outside. I'm sorry, more restricted diffusion, brighter on the outside, darker on the inside. So what that tells us is that this tumor is very cellular on the outside and more stromal on the inside, whereas this tumor is more homogeneous, it's more uniform, it kind of looks the same everywhere. So which is which? Well, the tumor that is cellular on the outside is a cholangio, and the tumor that's more uniform is an HCC. Now, this case you might say, well, this case is obvious because it has the liver surface retraction, which is so characteristic of cholangio, but you can imagine that sometimes you won't have the liver surface retraction. So this is a feature of cholangia, the so-called target appearance on DWI, in which you have restricted peripheral diffusion and less restricted uh, central diffusion. I also found diffusion very helpful looking for metastases, so I like to use EAVIS to look for METs, patient with colon cancer. I look for black holes here. I look for corresponding bright dots on diffusion. So here's a MET, dark on uh, EAVIS, bright on diffusion. There's a MET, uh, dark on EAVIS, bright on diffusion. Here's another one, bright on diffusion, dark on EAVIS. So it's this correspondence. I see it here, then I hunt for it here. If I see it on both sets of images, uh, then I call it a metastasis. Okay, technical tips. I already talked about this. Use parallel imaging. This is with parallel imaging. 
This is without parallel imaging. Just to drum this home, which one is parallel imaging, which one is not parallel imaging? So on the previous slide, I put parallel imaging on the top without parallel imaging on the bottom. Did I do the same thing? No. With parallel imaging on the bottom. So always do parallel imaging. Use the shortest TE possible. So remember we were talking about you can always make your diffusion gradients bigger by having longer TEs, but there's a cost to pay. Diffusion weighted imaging doesn't like long TEs. If you don't believe me, imagine that you want to drum up business for your practice and you're going to go out there and show people this is the quality diffusion I do, right? No one's going to send their patients to you. If you show this image, well, maybe they won't either, but at least you have a fighting chance. Don't push the spatial resolution. Use low spatial resolution. This is a 128 by 128. This is an acceptable image. 128 by 160, barely acceptable. 128 by 192, not acceptable. 256 by 192 would be a crime to charge the patient for this image, wouldn't it? And everything else is the same. This has to do with the fact that these images have an EPI readout, and the EPI is very sensitive to matrix size. So use low spatial resolution. Uh, the manufacturers will tell you to use navigators. It's very fancy stuff, but I'm not sure how much it makes a difference. So here's a patient, uh, free breathing navigator. Is this image a little bit better than this? Uh, yeah, probably a little bit, but um, this is, you know, but this takes a long, I don't know. So I guess the bottom line is that um, it's not clear to me that navigators are actually clinically that much better than free breathing, although I guess they're a little bit sharper. Okay, pitfalls. So blind spot. Uh, so here's a patient that has a cancer in the right lobe of the liver on gadolinium, and here it is on diffusion. What's happening in the left lobe of the liver? I see a lesion right here. Is that a met? Is that not a met? I don't know, because the left lobe of the liver sits right underneath the heart. The heart beats on the left lobe of the liver. It causes lots of signal loss, and the left lobe of the liver is often a blind spot on DWI. So DWI is a very powerful technique for the right lobe of the liver, not such a great technique uh, for the left lobe of the liver. So I guess if you're imaging patients that have had left lobectomies, then DWI is very good, uh, but probably not you probably can't suggest that every human being gets a left lobectomy just in case they ever need a DWI uh, of the liver. Now, DWI is not that good for HCC. Uh, I've shown cases where it helps, but I, but I now want to emphasize that HCC can be very tough to detect on diffusion. So here is a diffusion weight image B0, and here's diffusion weight image B500. Look, I really tried hard, right? I did 8 millimeters 2 necks, 6 millimeters 3 necks, 5 millimeters 4 necks, 5 millimeters 4 necks large field of view. I mean, poor patient. I really, really was trying hard to find this patient's cancer on the EWI. Could not do it. But here it is with gadolinium. There's the cancer, washout, capsule, hepatobiliary phase, hypointensity. So the teaching point here is look how hard I tried to find this cancer with DWI, and I could not do it. So HCCs often are invisible on DWI. Just a couple more slides to go. Uh, yeah? Do you think that's because of the characteristics? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's, I think you, that's a great point. I think it's actually both. I think what's happening is that H, so the cirrhotic liver, because of all the fibrous tissue, tends to have hindered diffusion. So first of all, the liver looks brighter than normal in cirrhosis, number one. And HCCs are not that cellular, so they're not particularly restricted. So you have hindered background tissue against not a particularly restricted tumor. So the diffusion doesn't help you differentiate. And HCCs, because they're made of hepatocytes, often have very similar T2 as background liver. So there's not a lot of T2 contrast. There's not a lot of diffusion contrast, so we can't tell. But your question's a great one because it's possible that these guys will solve the problem because what restriction spectrum imaging is hopefully going to be able to do is to differentiate hindered diffusion from restricted diffusion. And 
then if we could do that, then we might be able to differentiate the hindered water in the cirrhotic liver from the mildly restricted water in the tumor, and then maybe we can pick up HCCs with RSI. But with conventional DWI, we don't reliably do it. So I am very, so um, if anyone here would like to work with Anders and Nate and David, get David out of that damn prostate and up to where it's really important. So we can see if we can tell the difference, by the way, I'm only kidding, okay? But if we could use this amazing technology to differentiate restricted tumor from hindered liver, this could be a home run. Well, it would be a home run. This is the beauty of RSI, even me, you know, like this organ. Does anyone recognize this organ? Um, I've been told that this is a prostate, um, and you know, to me it just looks like a gray blob. Uh, but you do RSI, and you know, even I can find this cancer. Uh, by the way, for the Navy folks here, uh, strongly recommend that you collaborate with David uh, to get some of this RSI stuff going. Uh, maybe you're already doing it, but if you're not, because you know, it's really you know, if nothing else, these images are really cool. Okay. Uh, this is the last slide. Take-home messages. DWI remains a qualitative tool in 2017. Primary use is lesion detection, sometimes used for lesion characterization like the cholangiocarcinoma case I just showed you, but you've got to be very careful with characterization. Many pitfalls. You can't tell normal from malignant nodes. Bowel often looks bright. I did not show you an example of that. Many blind spots left over the liver very, very inconsistently visualized. Radiologists have used the wrong terminology for years. They call everything restricted. That's incorrect use of the terms. What you should start thinking of is the following. There is free diffusion and impeded diffusion, and impeded might be hindered or restricted. So if you're not sure if it's hindered or restricted, 